Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Miller and I am our Director of Partnerships here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And today we're really excited to kick off Patient Safety Awareness Week with our very first webinar of the week um, called Patient Safety Past, Present, and Future. Next slide, please. Perfect. So I'll just really quickly go through the learning objectives for today. Um, the, the first learning objective is examine the outcomes of the past 20 years of global healthcare safety improvement efforts on patient harm. The second is recognize why patient safety is so important and the impact preventable medical harm has on patients and families. The third is identify the typical patient safety gaps in most healthcare organizations. The fourth, summarize what general public, patients, and families can do to eliminate harm. And finally, commit to zero preventable harm and death in healthcare. So we're also really excited to announce that we will be offering continuing education credit for board certified patient advocates um, for today's live webinar. And we'll provide a little bit more information about the CE process at the end of today's presentation. And this next slide just shows that our panelists and speakers have no financial um, disclosures to provide. Um, so again, we'll provide more information at the end about the process of receiving your CE. Um, so before we introduce our panelists, I did want to provide a few housekeeping items. Um, we will have a 15 minute question and answer session at the very end of this presentation. So if throughout the webinar you have any questions that you'd like our panelists to answer, there is a Q&A section at the very bottom of um, the Zoom tab. You can just hover over it and submit your question, and I will be monitoring those, and we'll have a chance to, at the end, ask the questions to any of the panelists um, to get those questions answered. If for some reason we don't get to your question, we will be sending these questions to our panelists after the live webinar, and we will be sure to send your responses out to ensure that everyone's questions are answered. Um, so with that said, again, very excited to welcome our two panelists. We have Helen Haskell, the president of Mothers Against Medical Air, and then we have our very own Donna Prosser, chief clinical officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So to kick us off, Helen, do you mind introducing yourself? Hello, I'm Helen Haskell. Um, I hope I know a lot of you already. Um, I've been a patient safety advocate for about 20 years, and I've been involved with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation um, from the time it began, really, in, in 2013, 2012 and 2013. Um, and I, I work with a number of different organizations, Mothers Against Medical Errors, Consumers Advancing Patient Safety, Patient Safety Action Network, and of course, Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And I am very happy to be here. Hi everybody, I'm Donna Prosser. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. I've been a nurse for a little over 30 years now. Um, and uh, I, so I've been a bedside nurse. I have been a hospital administrator. I've been a consultant. And I have also been a family member and, and, and a patient on the other side of the bed. So I really understand how, um, you know, all of the quality and safety issues that we have in healthcare from a 360 degree lens. Um, and I also have been working in the quality and safety space for the past 20 years. So I've um, been at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for a little over a year now, and really excited to be here today as a panelist. Thanks, Sarah. Well, thank you, Donna. Donna, Helen, very excited to have you guys on this call today. And with that said, I think Helen, we'll, we'll pass it over to you. Okay. Um... So I will start by talking about the problem. So the problem is that preventable medical harm remains a leading cause of death in the United States and across the world. There's no standard mechanism for tracking deaths due to medical error, which means that all current statistics are estimates rather than counts. In the US, we have several estimates that more than um, 200,000 people die each year, making medical error the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. If you include delayed effects and less obvious errors like misdiagnosis, it's probably much higher. Globally, medical error is estimated to be the 14th leading cause of death, um, killing more people than HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. In some parts of the world, Harm from medical error is calculated to cause as much mortality as the leading diseases in those regions. COVID-19 has surpassed medical error as a leading cause of death this year, 
but the pandemic has shown a spotlight on the systemic safety issues in healthcare today. These can no longer be ignored. Uh, next slide, please, Donna. The global economic impact is estimated to be billions in the US a lot. Um, conservative estimate is about 20 billion. The global economic impact is even larger. The OECD has calculated that 15% or more of hospital expenditures and activities in the 13 OECD countries can be attributed to treating safety barriers. This again is probably a conservative figure and doesn't take into account the ripple effects of things like lost productivity and added costs for the victims and for those who must leave the workforce to care for them. Next slide, please, Donna. So patient safety isn't a new discussion. There were occasional articles on patient harm going back to the 1960s, but it's been about 30 years since the quality and safety movement as we know it was really born. Um, Harvard pediatric surgeon Lucian Lee, pictured here, is thought of as the father, um, now the grandfather of patient safety. Uh, Dr. Lee fired a shot across the bow of the medical frigate, so to speak, with a 1994 article called Error in Medicine, in which he estimated that around 180,000 people die each year due to medical error. He was the one who came up with the famous jumbo jet analogy, equating medical harm to the toll we would have if three jumbo jets crashed every two days. Dr. Leap had made a study of safety science and other industries, and in his article, he introduced the idea that we still that still guides us, that we should focus on faulty systems as the underlying cause of most medical harm. Next slide, please, Donna. Also in the 1990s, there were two large studies in New York, Colorado, and Utah showing significant rates of harm and death from medical error. Most of this kind of early work remained hidden in the medical literature until the 1999 Institute of Medicine report to Air as Human reported the now well-known figure of 44 through 98,000 deaths a year from medical error. These numbers came from those New York and Colorado Utah studies, which had been undertaken to find answers about malpractice litigation. They only included cases that would have been likely to prevail in a court of law, which is a relatively high bar. So as shocking as these numbers were at the time, again, they were thought likely to be underestimates. To Air as Human was followed in 2001 by a second IOM report called Crossing the Quality Chasm, which laid out a roadmap for improvement, focusing on six aims to make care safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. These are now called the STEEP aims, S-T-E-E-E-P, three E's, to make them easier to remember. Next slide, please, Donna. So this was when I dropped into the picture between the two IOM reports. This smiling boy is my son, Lewis, who died at the age of 15 from a medication error following elective surgery in a major teaching hospital. Lewis was a vibrant, healthy boy who did not have to die. What killed him was the defective system that Lucian Leap had spoken to six years earlier. He died from what's called failure to rescue, that is a failure to escalate care because of cumbersome, slow-moving systems that are not designed to deal with emergencies. When Lewis died, I entered almost by accident into the other patient safety movement, the movement run by patients who'd suffered serious medical harm and were focused on the idea of consumer action and patient-centered care. Because the patient safety movement as a whole was small, we were all interconnected at some level. And the STEEP -E 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 principles of the second IOM report came from a major patient organization, the Picker Institute which was dedicated to elevating the patient voice and focusing care on the patient. Another focal point for patients at the time was Rosemary Gibson's book, Wall of Silence, 
in which she gathered patient stories and emphasized the culture of secrecy that continued and still continues to enable patient harm. Rosemary helped bring together a community of people focused on solutions for the patient. And her work inspired a number of healthcare leaders like David Mayer of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Next slide, please, Donna. Following the two IOM reports, from my perspective as a patient, things did not get better. In fact, they seemed to get worse, with infection especially seeming to run rampant as medicine expanded with few controls in, in place. Then in 2004, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement launched the first of its big patient safety campaigns, the Save 100,000 Lives campaign, which pulled together stakeholders from all parts of healthcare to implement a menu of patient, basic patient safety measures. This was a turning point. It was followed rapidly by other initiatives that had been in the works since the IOM reports. Consumer Union Stop Hospital Infections campaign resulted in a number of state laws around disclosing hospital infections and ultimately in national reporting of infections and other hospital acquired conditions. IHI style improvement collaboratives and disease focused registries became part of the discourse. Under prodding from the Obama administration, electronic medical records were finally implemented um, in a system that had remained paper long after everything else had been computerized. Patient surveys like HCAPs finally gave patients an organized way of providing feedback about what they were seeing and how they were being treated. And the Affordable Care Act of 2010 and other legislation included a number of patient safety provisions that are still unrolling. Just next month, this is not on the list, patients are supposed to be granted free access to their medical records as they are being created. Next slide, please. So there's been a lot of work in patient safety. The problem is, at least in my opinion, that medicine has changed faster than patient safety solutions have, and that we still do not have a good handle on what's actually happening. In 2010, the Office of the Inspector General published a report in which it examined the medical records of every Medicare patient in the country on a single day in, in 2008. They found a 27% rate of medical harm adding up to an estimated annual medical error death rate of 180,000 among US Medicare beneficiaries alone. This was one of three reports published in 2010 and 2011 that showed high rates of harm in hospitalized patients. One in Colorado and Utah showed a circa 33% rate of harm. One in North Carolina showed about an 18% rate of harm with no change over six years. All these studies use data from 2008 and earlier. Later reports like the James and McCary studies that I mentioned earlier drew on these reports to project national rates of harms, but we do not have any large scale data that dates after 2008, which means we simply do not have a systematic way of knowing what the effect of our considerable later in interventions has been. What we do know, anecdotally, is that harm continues to occur. What we don't have is the patterns and trends on a large scale that could help us address it in a more rational way. And on that cheery note, I'm going to turn the virtual microphone over to Donna to talk about some of these solutions. So thank you for your, for your attention. Donna? Thanks, thanks Alan, I appreciate it. Um, everybody, uh, if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q and A. Um, we're gonna we'll get to the Q and A section at the end, and I think we'll have plenty of time for questions. So so um, keep them coming for us. Um, thanks, Helen, for for you know taking us through the the background and the history of patient safety. Um, you know, and, and as as Helen mentioned, um, you know it's not for lack of trying that we haven't fixed this problem yet, and so. Last year at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, we said, you know, gosh, why is this? Why is it that we've been working so hard? Um, and, and what is it that we can do in, to improve this problem in the future? And so we thought, you know, the, the, most, the, the, the first thing that we want to do is get a pulse of where the public 
sits on this. Does the general public even understand how much of a problem patient safety is? Because our, our premise was, you know, we're never going to fix patient safety if the public doesn't demand it, and the public isn't going to demand it if they don't know that it's a problem. Um, so, and as you can see here on this slide, last April when we surveyed, um, uh, the, in, in this case, we surveyed those in our network, which is the, the purple color there, and then those in the United States just in the general public. We're repeating the survey again this year, and we're hoping to have more international representation moving forward. But you can see that nearly 91% of the folks that we polled indicated that they had heard either nothing or very little about medical error in, in their region. So, um, so we know that this is a huge focus area for us. There's also um, you know, a lot of reasons, as Helen alluded to, why we haven't fixed this yet. Um, in, in hospitals and other healthcare organizations. Um, you know, again, not for lack of trying, I've been one of those administrators that has worked really, really hard over the last two decades. Um, you know, none of us got into medicine for any other reason except that we want to help people, we want to make people better. And so, um, you know, so we've, we've tried things like, um, you know, like performance improvement, you know, that became a real big thing. Um, in, in the 90s and the, and the 2000s. But what we did essentially was we created this, what I like to call a patchwork quilt of improvement because the right hand didn't necessarily know what the left hand was improving. And so, um, you know, and, and, and those teams were really focusing mostly on process change, not necessarily culture change in the organization. We also in healthcare tend to focus on, uh, on blame. We, we, we look for somebody that we can blame for making a mistake. We're always looking at individual behavior rather than examining systems and processes. And for that reason, the front line is, is often afraid to speak up and they're, you know, they, they don't always want to mention when they've made a mistake because they don't want to be blamed. We've talked about patient-centered care for a very long time in healthcare. Uh, we know that we have to have patients as part of their their healthcare team, but care today remains clinician-centered more than patient-centered in general. And, and some of the reason for that is that the care environment has become so incredibly complex, it's really a lot harder now to take care of patients than it was 20 years ago. And part of that is because care coordination is lacking across the continuum. There is no one person who really oversees a patient's entire journey throughout the continuum. Now, there might be, um, you know, navigators in orthopedic or oncology or cardiac programs that are very specifically focused on care coordination for that particular disease process. But in general, across the entire care of a patient, a patient's continuum, there is no one person who's really overseeing all of that. Another reason why we haven't fixed this yet is because performance improvement is a lot harder than we ever anticipated it to be. Sustaining change is really, really hard because we're dealing with uh, you know, healthcare, which and a, a lot of a lot of healthcare organizations are struggling financially. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of change. There's a lot of new physicians and new nurses and travel nurses and 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 various individuals that are coming and going all of the time. Um, so so it's a lot harder than than we thought um, to to be able to to sustain this and do this well. And then finally, I think the most important lesson that we've learned over the last 20 years is that culture change is really hard. It, it takes a long time. We can't just go and say, hey, start being patient-centered um, because, you know, a lot of folks think they're being patient-centered when they're not. And so, um, and so that culture change, that mindset change just takes a really, really long time. So here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, you know, our vision is zero preventable harm and death by 2030. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to get to the place where, where there is no longer uh, preventable harm or death in any healthcare organization. Well, we believe that the only way to do that is to require that every healthcare organization becomes what we call a high reliability organization. Now, a high reliability organization is, is one that has operated for a very long period of time without having an error. So the, um, um, you know, if you think about nuclear power, as Helen mentioned, the aviation industry, the oil and gas industry, those organizations are anticipating errors. They're looking ahead to see what can they do to prevent the error from happening in the first place. In medicine, we wait until an error occurs and then we go do a deep dive and a root cause analysis and say, hmm, I wonder why that happened and I wonder if we can prevent that from happening again. So, um, so we need to just change our mindset a little bit um, in, you know, in, from, from the get-go um, in order to become a high reliability organization. 
The other thing that we advocate here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation that organizations do is that we stop focusing so much on the population specific improvements that we've been doing over the last 20 years and focus more right now on creating a foundation for safe and reliable care. So, you know, we, what we've seen a lot happen in organizations is, you know, maybe there's a team that's working to improve sepsis or falls or pressure ulcers or, you know, uh, or unintended extubations, any number of safety issues. We have a team that's working on it. We have, um, you know, a lot of effort that is put into creating this change. And usually that change is really successful because there are what we call champions, those healthcare heroes who really, really care about, about that particular patient population and want to make a difference. And maybe we see change in, you know, in a short period of time, but very often it doesn't last and it's not sustained because those champions leave, they move on to another project, um, you know, or something along those lines. And without that foundation in place, then that work then begins to crumble because it's person dependent improvement and not really something that was, um, was baked into the culture. And so here at the patient safety movement, um, you know, we've really changed our focus with our commitment model with healthcare organizations. And we're asking healthcare organizations now, not just hospitals, all healthcare organizations across the entire continuum, outpatient and inpatient, to commit to creating three critical components to create that foundation for safe and reliable care. That is a person-centered culture of safety, a holistic continuous improvement framework, and an effective model for sustainment. And so what do we mean? What do we mean by all of that? Well, a person-centered culture of safety means that that organization is focused on the safety of every person in the organization. This is not just patients and families, but doctors and nurses and visitors and vendors and everybody else that is in that organization. One thing that the pandemic has taught us is we cannot have patient safety without health worker safety. And so, it, so everybody in the whole organization needs to have patient safety or, or, or everybody's safety as top of mind. And then we need care systems that are patient-centered as part of that person-centered culture. Um, you know, that means that our care systems are well-coordinated and that they're individualized. Patients should go into the hospital and get a care plan that works for them, not one that is just a blanket care plan for anybody with their particular diagnosis or disease process. And in order to, to really have effective patient-centered care, we have to include the patient and the family as an equal member of the care team and engage them in improvement activities. Um, there should be a patient or family member on every improvement team in, in, in the organization because they're the ones, that, and, and they don't have to necessarily be on every meeting, um, you know, to, uh, and, and spend a lot of time, but at a minimum, there needs to be some effort from every improvement team to understand the perspective of the patient and the family. The other thing that has to be done um, as part of this work is to hardwire transparency and respect and trust you know, in order for, for the community to, um, to have faith in their hospitals and their healthcare systems, you know, they need to trust that if something goes wrong, that, the, that there's going to be openness, that, that the administration is going to practice what we call candor and, and, and openly discuss the errors with patients and families. Make it so that, um, you know, the, the, the front line is not afraid to step up, that they they respect each other enough to be transparent about the, the errors that are happening. And then of course, we, we need to not, not blame people for, for making those individual mistakes. And so organizations should use what we call a just culture approach to determine whether or not, um, you know, whether or not people should be blamed versus the system. And a just culture, um, you know, this is a program that provides an algorithm that helps leaders to walk through a particular uh, event that occurred and decide was this human error, in which case we have to figure out how to make sure that prevent that error from ever happening again. Was this reckless behavior, or, I'm sorry, um, at risk behavior, where maybe somebody stepped outside the bounds of what we expected them to do, but there was a really good reason why that happened. Maybe they didn't have the right PPE or they were short staffed that day, or uh, there are several reasons why that occurred. And we need to examine that. And again, not blame the individual, but fix the system. And then finally, if we decide that, no, no, this was reckless behavior, this never should have happened in the first place. Well, then we address that in a very different manner. So, um, so that is what the just culture is all about. And, you know, Helen talked about Lucian Leap earlier. He said once that the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry 
is that we punish people for making mistakes. And that is probably the number one thing that we have to address in healthcare. The second critical component of a, a foundation for safe and reliable care is creating a holistic continuous improvement framework. Now, I remember back in the 80s and 90s, you know, when I was a young nurse, a student nurse and a young nurse, and, you know, whenever Joint Commission would come, they would want to know what is our performance improvement framework. And we had it on the back of our badge. Like, nobody really knew what the letters meant. Um, and it usually spelled something like a word like improve, and each letter meant something, but we didn't really know what the letters meant. We just knew it was an acronym for something. Um, and, and, but we've been talking about continuous improvement for a really long time in, in healthcare. Um, and the problem is, again, that we don't always apply that in a holistic manner across the entire organization. And so maybe you have three different teams working on three different problems, all using a different approach. Maybe one person is using a PDSA approach and another team is using a DMAIC approach because that's the way they learned how to do it. And somebody else is applying Lean and Six Sigma to, to, their, um, to, to their project planning. And so that is very confusing for staff. It's really, really hard to get people to be good at performance improvement when we throw a lot of acronyms and names at them that are confusing. So that is the, you know, it's the first thing that we recommend is that, you know, there's that, 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 that framework is holistic and consistent um, across the organization. And making sure that that work is coordinated at a singular source. What happens is that organizations are out there making so many different changes that they cannot figure out um, you know, what the other teams are doing. And so then they're all competing for the same resources and that becomes inefficient. Um, again, as I mentioned before, patients and families, their voice should always be very, very clear um, in, ac across all of the improvement work that we're doing in an organization. And that one single consistent source, whether it's a, a person or a department or a committee of some kind, should be able to see how that patient voice is interwoven across all of that improvement work. And then finally, um, utilizing technology to do a better job at looking at our data. We, uh, you know, Helen talked about how we don't really know how many people die every year of medical error. We don't know how many people are harmed every year because of medical error. And that is mostly because we just don't collect the data the way that we need to. Um, and, you know, we, we, um, we've gotten a lot better in the last 20 years, but we still have a long way to go to maximize the use of technology to make sure that we are addressing problems in the right way based on, on, on truth and data. And then, you know, another thing that I think that, you know, the general public doesn't really understand so well is um, that sometimes it's really hard for the frontline to know what's expected of them and to know what to do. We rely a lot on memory in medicine. You know, I, I rely heavily on the way I was trained. Um, and so, you know, if you have somebody who's been a clinician for five years, 10 years, and 20 years, they all might have a different frame of mind based on when they trained. Um, and so the so organizations, you know, there is no lack of policy and procedure manuals in most healthcare organizations, but the problem is there's so much information that people just can't keep it straight. I remember in one hospital system that I worked in, we counted the number of policies and procedures that we had just so that we could get an idea of how hard is it for the frontline to really have a good understanding of their expectations. We had more than 6,500 documents across this hospital system, policies and procedures. So, you know, it's, it's no wonder that people weren't necessarily following the policies and procedures because there were too many to keep track of. So, um, and so we recommend at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation that, that organizations really take a hard look at, at, their, at all of those documents that guide practice and make it really easy for the frontline to know what to do. We call this um, the six P's of clinical practice improvement, and, and, um, and we work with hospitals and healthcare systems to, to improve these and make them easier to understand, and for, not just for, patient, for, for clinicians, but also for patients and families. And then finally, we help hospitals and healthcare systems to improve um, sustainment over time. Um, you know, it, it, human beings do this work. We are human beings taking care of other human beings. So it is a very different industry than nuclear power or aviation, uh, but no less, um, you know, no less risky in terms of, of patient safety. Um, so we just have to remember that um, we have to change the conditions under which human beings work if we really want to change the human condition. And so, so um, we work with hospitals to help them to, um, to, organize their, their improvement work and to create those more effective learning systems 
um, across the, the organization. And so, so the, you know, the question, the real question then is, you know, what can you do? Well, as a, you know, as a concerned citizen, um, for, first of all, make sure that you know what your organizational scores are. Um, you know, look at the leapfrog scores and the hospital compare scores if you are here in the United States and, um, and, and, and see what, you know, what the safety record is for your healthcare organization. Ask them. Ask when, when you're there, ask them, do you have a continuous improvement framework? Or do you have a person-centered culture of safety? Um, you help us to advocate for national and regional patient safety boards. We don't know what this would look like yet. There's some, some work out there being led by the Jewish Healthcare Foundation to create a patient safety authority, um, very similar to the patient safety, to the, um, the, the National Transportation um, safety board. And so, um, you know, again, we're, we're not going to fix this problem unless the general public helps us to demand that this happens. Um, and so if we had some kind of regional oversight, then we would be able to determine if an error occurred, did it occur because an organization doesn't have those foundations, those three critical components in place, or did it, did they do everything that they could to try to keep patients safe and the error occurred anyway? That's really where we need to get to now is understanding, um, you know, the, the gaps in, in, um, and the root causes of some of these errors. So having some kind of, of, of National Patient Safety Board would, would certainly assist in that effort. Again, supporting other legislation that makes patient safety data more transparent is, is really important. You know, there's, there's um, organizations are, um, are surveyed on a regular basis especially here in the United States, um, you know, there are accrediting bodies that, that will, um, will come in and do a survey and determine whether or not an organization is safe and then, and then provide a report for that, organi for that organization. Um, there are some people who believe that that needs to be transparent. Hospitals will tell you they paid for that consulting report and it shouldn't be transparent. Um, but, you know, we're, uh, however it is that we, that we do this, we need to make it so that when, you know, if a death occurred because of medical error, that's captured somehow on, um, on a death certificate. That, you know, if there are errors in a hospital that occur, if advent, adverse events occur, that that information is very clear to the people who seek care there, as well as all of the things that an organization is doing about it. Um, you know, again, think about, you know, the aviation industry or the nuclear power industry. If there is an accident that occurs, the entire world knows about it. Whereas in healthcare, accidents are occurring every single day and nobody knows. Um, we also need to look at you know, supporting legislation that aligns financial incentives. It is right now not, um, it, is, it, is, it is not necessarily in an organization's best financial interest to do this work of creating this foundation for safe and reliable care because it is really hard. It does take a lot of manpower and initially it is slow going and it feels like you're spending more money than you are saving initially. And over time, over time, as you have more quality and, and safe processes, then financial stability will occur. But that is a hard, it, it, that's a hard sell to an executive who's being held to financial uh, goals for one year at a time. So we need to align those financial incentives so that the needs of the, and the, 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 um, the, the, the desires of the patient and the family are aligned with the desires of the clinicians and the administrators. And then finally, the last thing that I can say is, you know, again, be an active member of your own care team. Make, you know, make, uh, you know, make yourself um, knowledgeable about your disease process. Ask questions. Um, and, um, and, you know, when you're choosing your physician, in, in the very beginning, ask them, how do you feel about, about, a patient, about patients being involved in their care? I do that when I, when I choose a new physician, I make sure that they are very clear from the outset that I direct, I, I'm the coordinator of my own care in conjunction with them as part of my care team. So, um, so uh, you know, I, I would say that is probably the most important thing that you can do um, for you and your loved ones is to get involved and to be that coordinator of care um, because that's just not something that is um, is part of our reality right now in healthcare. So, um, so with that, um, I have nothing else to add. So I'm going to pass it back over to Sarah. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much. We again really appreciate your insight. 
Um, just a reminder for those of you that are on the live webinar, we are offering continuing educational credit, so for board certified patient advocates. Um, you will receive a certificate, so please note that the CE may take about five to seven days to process, but if you have any questions, feel free to email clinical at patientsafetymovement.org and we will address your questions appropriately. Um, so with that said, I will go ahead and lead us into the Q&A session. We, we have a little bit more than 15 minutes, so um, if you guys, again, have any questions for our panelists, please pop them in the chat. We only have a few. Um, so with that said, I will go ahead and start. It looks like we have two comments and one question, so I will address the comments um, from our very own Marty Hatley. Um, excellent overview, Helen. I'd add that there are more recent data sources, also from the IOG, about death from preventable harm in non hospital settings, for example, nursing homes. And SIDM is developing data from liability claims about harm in ambulatory settings. Isn't it time for us to look beyond hospitals to other settings? Um, I didn't know if either of you, Donna or Helen, wanted to address that comment. Well, I'd love to. Uh, so I think, um, yes, ambulatory care is sort of a black hole. We have um, the, the big malpractice insurers specifically CRICO, the Harvard Medical Insurer, has got a lot of data that they have really mined um, on diagnostic issues in particular because they saw diagnosis as, um, as one of the major causes of, of malpractice claims. So the malpractice insurers have an interest in, in reducing um, medical harm, right? It, it, it reduces their payouts. Um, and they they can do a particularly good good job at that. Um, OIG does lots of reports about um, harm in all sorts of different places, tremendous amount of information in their reports. The problem is, I think, that you know, none of these are global, none of them are comprehensive, so it's great to have a database looking at diagnosis or surgery, um, which what I'd like to see is something that really puts all that together. Ambulatory, nursing homes, um, hospitals, um, outpatient surgery, everything. And, um, you know, and look at the whole picture where the harm is occurring. Because you're so right, Marty, that most care is moving out of hospitals. You know, even operations that it makes you cringe to think about are being done on outpatient basis. And, um, we don't have a handle on that. We don't know even the infection rates in these uh, uh, ambulatory surgery centers. Um, so, you know, something's, it, it's sort of in this state where hospitals were uh, when, when we began this journey. And um, so we need to get a handle on it um, globally. And, you know, we have a lot of solutions. Uh, we need to have a global way to apply them as well. So you can see that I'm a big picture sort of gal, and <laughs> you know that's what I'm looking for. So Donna, I don't know if you have something to add. No, no, I agree 100%. We definitely need to um, expand our 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 overview into the outpatient setting, and definitely something that is a a goal for us here at the Patient Safety Movement. We started on that journey to expand beyond the hospital walls in 2020. Um, but we're really going to um, uh, focus even more in 2021. Yeah, you know, we started on hospitals because they're easy, right? They're already pretty regulated, um, you know, that you can, um, they're centralized. You can get data from hospitals um, and you can tell hospitals what to do much more easily than lots of little practices. Um, but, you know, we have the means of, of sort of coordinating things now. But, um, that we didn't have 20 years ago. Yeah, I think I think we we started with the low hanging fruit, right, Helen? We said, what's the easiest thing that we can go after? And we did a lot of great things with the low hanging fruit, but now you know we pretty much picked it all. So <laughs> now the hard work begins, right? <laughs> great. Um, the next question I think is um, directed more for Donna, but. So Donna, regarding punishment, any thoughts on how we get past providers conflating being held accountable for preventable harm with punishment or blame? Um, yeah, I think, you know, again, it, it goes back to that just culture. Um, and, you know, if, if an organization, whether it's a doctor's office or a nursing home or a hospital, 
Um, you know, they, they need to take a look at how they are right now um, uh, dealing with events that occur. Um, and applying that algorithm can certainly help to make it um, really easy for leaders to to come to that decision about about the root cause of an error. So um, so I, I can tell you in um, in the state of North Carolina, actually, the North Carolina Board of Nursing adopted the Just Culture algorithm as part of their disciplinary process and asked every leader in the state if um, for any event that happened with a nurse to go through the Just Culture algorithm and report that to the Board of Nursing because they recognize that a lot of times, you know, we, we, might, we might say, ooh, that was reckless behavior. You really shouldn't work here anymore. So we fire somebody because of their behavior and then they go to the hospital down the street and they continue their bad behavior down the street. So, um, and so the, the Board of Nursing actually got involved with that, which was um, very, very helpful. It taught leaders across the state how to apply the Just Culture algorithm. And it also helped us to address on a state level, those few individuals who truly are reckless that don't need to be taking care of patients at all. Great, thank you, Donna. Um, the next one is more of a comment. Um, so the comment says, I am of the opinion that different QI methodologies fit better than others for different issues slash problems. I understand the need for congruence, but I don't think we should be limited to one. For example, lean versus IHI. Both have their own places as do others. Um, Donna, do you, do you want to address that comment? Yeah, yeah. So I guess what I mean, all the tools need to be applied based on the, the particular um, project at hand, right? I guess what I'm talking about there is the framework in, in terms of the, the, the documents, the, right? The, the, the forms that people have to fill out in your organization, um, the, you know, the, the, the acronyms that they have to memorize. So think about the end user. If I, am, if I am a committee member and I belong to three different committees and there's three different frameworks being used in those committees, I'm going to get really confused about performance improvement, right? And at the end of the day, whether we're talking about PDSA or DMAIC or, you know, the nursing process or anything, it's really all the same problem solving methodology. Um, and so that's what I'm suggesting is that organizations choose that high level methodology, but in terms of what specific tools they use to address root causes and, and such, then they definitely um, should be able to, to apply the tool based on the need. Great, thank you, Donna. Um, and I can combine these next two questions. So how does one become board certified as a patient advocate and are there any training programs for patient safety advocates? Either of you are welcome to answer that one. I suspect that some of the people on our call can answer this better than we can. Um, yes, there is the, um, there's a, a board certification and um, I think there are training programs. I don't know um, if somebody could share in the chat. Are the, is there audio enabled, Sarah, or not for attendees? Maybe not for attendees, no. Maybe but yes, in the chat the answer to that question because um, I'm actually not that clear. It's been a long time since I've been directly involved with that. Okay. Yeah, there are a couple of different folks out there that do some training. Um, you know, there's the um, the Alliance for Professional Healthcare Advocates, APHA is available. Um, and um, and mm -hmm. then the, um, the patient certification um, board is, or I'm sorry, patient Advocate Certification Board um, is the one that provides that um, the board certified patient advocate credential and they also have great resources as well. Perfect. Yeah, and if anyone on the call today knows of any other, um, you know, trainings, feel free to pop that into the chat so that everyone can view that. I do see a few people having conversations in here, so that's great. Um, so the next question of new RNs practicing on their own very quickly after graduation and limited clinical training they now receive. Donna, do you have any comments on that? I'm sorry, you, you broke up for just a second. Could you say that one more time? Yes. Um, is there any discussion of new RNs practicing on their own very quickly after graduation and the limited clinical training they now receive? Ah. Uh. Well, yes, that's, I, I, and, and that's a, a concern, I think, for all clinicians. There's so much information that people have to learn in school these days that they can't possibly learn it all. 
Um, and so it, it is crucial, especially for nurses, that um, organizations have a solid orientation um, and you know, residency plan for them um, so that they can learn all of those skills. The problem is that a lot of hospitals perceive that they can't afford that and they, and they don't necessarily recognize the, um, the patient safety implications there. So um, I think it is absolutely necessary that organizations have a residency for nurses. Physicians have a residency. When they graduate, they cannot, you know, cannot um, function as an independent physician until they go through an internship and a residency. And I, I think nurses should have some, some form of that a, as well. So, and here at the Patient Safety Movement, we're happy to help organizations figure out how to, to make that happen in, in your uh, hospital. Great, thank you, Donna. Um, so this next question, I, I might rephrase it a little bit just because um, we, we recently just launched our new commitment model in September, so we don't have a, a ton of um, improvement projects around this. But the question is, Donna, how do you sustain patients' engagement in hospital projects? But I guess I'll rephrase that to say, how do you plan to sustain patients' engagement in hospital projects? Um, I think, you know, again, it comes back to how we think about including people. So I, um, you know, a lot of times when we say we want to include X person in this project, people here, that means they have to come to every meeting on Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock and be physically present. That is not necessarily the case. I think, you know, the, the project lead needs to be able to have a good understanding of who the stakeholders are in their performance improvement project. And they also need to um, to have a really good handle on the pulse of the patient and the family voice. Maybe it requires a phone call to them to run something by them to get their input. Maybe it requires them to be physically present at a meeting. So, um, but you know, and it could be anywhere in between. So just because they can't physically be present all the time doesn't mean that we don't talk to them and, and, and get their opinions and their feedback. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then it looks like we have one more question left. So again, if you guys on the call have any additional questions, please pop them in the Q&A as I'm, I'm moderating that. But the last question is, how much has CANDOR reduced medical errors? You know, I think that's something else we don't know. Um, really all that what's been looked at is how much it reduces um, claims and satisfaction of those who've been through the program, but um, there is that link between actually the disclosure process and improving patient safety, um, I think still needs to be more clearly defined. And um, like everything else, we don't know. It's something that we have to sort of take on faith for a while because we do know it reduces distress. Agreed. Yeah, and, and, and it's, you know, unfortunately not something that has been as widely adopted as it needs to be. Um, there are still too many organizations who perceive that, um, that uh, you know, being that open and transparent is a financial risk for the organization. So, um, you know, uh, so until we get everybody doing it, we may not, not know the full impact. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, okay, so it looks like we actually have another question in the chat. Um, so what is your vision for anticipating safety issues so that we can prevent harm? Either of you are welcome to answer that one. Helen, do you want to go first? What, can you say it again? I'm sorry, I didn't quite. Of What's course. The, the question is, what is your vision for anticipating safety issues so that we can prevent harm? Oh, well, my, my vision is the big database in the sky. It's the patient safety authority that would be, you know, able to, and we have the ability now with, for example, global trigger tools, tools, the IHI global trigger tools, you can run them in real time. And there are other software programs too, um, and catch things as they're happening. Um, it's certainly possible in any in any in institution and um and i think it could be possible from outside the institution as well so i think technology is really going to be an answer to a lot of this um it just lets us do things that we couldn't do before i think that you know the other question is you still have to have adequate staffing 
to do what the technology is telling you and to run the technology. And that's, that's, you know, that's an issue that um, is just perpetual in healthcare, you know, going back to the last century, to the century before last, staffing issues. Um, and I don't know how we address that, how you make people staff up. Yeah, I, I, I would have to agree with Helen that, you know, staffing is definitely a major issue. We cannot be, you know, anticipating errors, doing root cause analysis of errors and taking care of people at the same time with the same folks. So, um, so that is definitely an issue. I think, you know, the other thing that we have to remember is that um, I think, well, I'm sorry, I, I forgot my, the thought because I got all, I, I started thinking about staffing. Helen got me all excited about, about a lack of staffing. So, uh, uh, but yeah, I think that that is definitely a huge issue. Yeah, well, talk about lack of staffing because I think it's, I think it's so important and it's often um, just sort of tiptoed around in patient safety discussions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Great, so is it looks like we have we do have one more question. Um, so the question, and Donna, we'll start with you for this one. Um, raising patient safety culture among the community needs a lot of effort. What is your advice to start spreading the concept? I, my advice is for everybody on this phone to go, or on this call, to go and talk to somebody that you know. So at the patient safety movement, we have a, a very ambitious goal that everybody in the world is going to commit to zero. Everybody. So patients, families, legislators, doctors, nurses, administrators, everybody. So um, that we need your help with that. So please, you know, share our website, share our patient stories, um, you know, invite people to come to webinars. We are gonna really step up our efforts here at the Patient Safety Movement in fiscal year 21 to improve education for the general public as well as for healthcare organizations on performance improvement and leadership development. So, um, so we'll have lots of information that folks can share. Thank you, Donna. Okay, it looks like I was able to address all of the questions in both the chat and the Q&A. So um, with that said, I guess I can wait a few more seconds to see if we get any more. Um, but I, I do want to address, I know a lot of you have asked in the chat if the slides will be available. I do want to say, if you haven't seen my response, um, yes, the slides and the live webinar recording will be available following this call on our website and on YouTube. Um, and I am really excited to see that some of you want to use our slides for training purposes, which is exactly what um, Donna and myself here at the foundation love to see in the future. Um, but with that said, I, I think we can end today's call if no one has any other questions. But Donna, Helen, wanted to thank you both so very much for your time and your, your really informative webinar. And again, we look forward to continuing these presentations throughout this week. Great, and I see that Michael Dejos just uh, and and Marcy Romero all, all, all offer, said uh, Happy Patient Safety Awareness Week. So, Happy Patient Safety yeah. Awareness Week to everybody. Great, thank you everyone for joining. Appreciate your time. Bye bye.